Major funding for this special Frontline series is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Additional funding is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Tonight, a Frontline special series of portraits of the people of the Soviet Union. This is Sergei Koryokin, an underground Soviet musician who leads a band called Popular Mechanics. The authorities say his music is too wild, too uncontrollable. Sergei says it's his life, his message. A portrait of Sergei Koryokin, made without permission of the Soviet authorities. Tonight, all that jazz. From the network of public television stations, a presentation of KCTS Seattle, WNET New York, WPBT Miami, WTVS Detroit, and WGBH Boston. This is a special Frontline series with Judy Woodruff. Good evening, and welcome to Comrades, a special Frontline series on life in the Soviet Union. At a time when the Soviet Union seems poised on the edge of dramatic changes, perhaps the most far-reaching since the Russian Revolution, we are bringing this series to you again because of its unique look at how citizens of the Soviet Union live and work, because of its rare insight into some of their dreams, their attitudes, their values. Comrades was made by a team of producers from the British Broadcasting Corporation. They spent two years traveling throughout the Soviet Union. They were allowed access, rarely granted a Western film crew. Tonight, the life of a young jazz and rock musician who is not officially recognized by the state. It's an unofficial portrait of an unofficial artist, made without the permission of the Soviet authorities. It is called All That Jazz. At the end, I'll be back to talk with the series producer and with two journalists who have reported from Moscow for years to measure the changes going on in Russia today and the impact of these changes on the people in this film. The film is narrated by Richard Denton. As far as I remember, I've always studied music. I was brought up on operas and operettas. When I was seven, I knew masses of arias and sang Traviata. I wanted to play the grand piano. It has a lot of everything. It was huge, black and white. Had a good sound, loud, great. I used to like loud noises. I still like loud noises. I virtually stopped playing the grand piano now because now it seems to be a rather quiet instrument. Sergei Kuryokin is a musician, which in the Soviet Union means he belongs to the intelligentsia. Before the revolution, the intelligentsia were people who lived by ideas and tended to oppose the establishment even if they belonged to it, like Pushkin and Tolstoy. Today, Official artists, musicians and writers belong to the appropriate union. Their work is approved of by the state and they're assured of a living in their chosen field. Unofficial means just the opposite. They're not approved of, they get no help and they usually have to earn their money some other way. 
Sergei Kuryokhin is an unofficial musician. For 18 months, we tried to get state permission to film Sergei, but it wasn't forthcoming. So, with the agreement of his friends and colleagues, we decided to film these unofficial musicians unofficially, surreptitiously posing as tourists with home video equipment. For them, it was a rare chance to share their music and opinions with the West. With Sergei is Tolia Bielkin, one of Leningrad's leading unofficial painters. His popularity has even won grudging acceptance from the state, and he's recently been given a chance to exhibit his work openly. He's a close friend of Sergei's, and they often share afternoons and flights of fancy. Let's drink to little animals. Okay, to that long-legged swine I wanted. The pig that possesses a future. You know what? I dream of having a cocker spaniel. Cocker? And definitely an Irish setter. Definitely two French bulldogs and a bull terrier. Bull terrier is what? It's a hybrid? No. It's like General Patton's dog. Ah, yes. <laughs> and then, of course, several reindeer. Definitely a porcupine. Definitely. I've got a weakness for lemurs. I like them. They'll be lemurs throughout the house. <laughs> They'll hang all over the house. They died as an awful epidemic. Amongst lemurs? Yes, they're dying of dehydration. Lemurs are dying throughout Leningrad. I'd hang them above my dinner table and I'd feed them bits of food. And anteaters don't hang over the table. <laughs> Too bad for them. I've gathered first-class musicians together who just feel very constrained by what they do on the professional stage. They'd like something more interesting. That's why they join Popular Mechanics. There are some excellent Soviet musicians amongst them. Teachers from the conservatory, pupils from the conservatory, rock groups known not just throughout the Soviet Union, but in Europe, too. Sergei's band, for reasons that even he has forgotten, is called Popular Mechanics, and one of the few places in which they can rehearse is Club 81. It's what you might call semi-official, the headquarters of a group of unapproved writers and poets given to them by the Ministry of Culture in the hope that it would discourage them from trying to publish abroad. Sergei was expelled from the Leningrad Conservatoire and the Institute of Culture for his non-conformity and non-attendance. I listened to the radio even when I was at school. Often it was my only source of information. I listened to it a great deal. I've got a very high opinion of my abilities, so my teachers had a hard time with me. They thought I was uh, a talented good-for-nothing, and that's pretty much what I was. My ear was better than anyone's in my group. It gave me great pleasure to hear notes better and to write musical dictation faster than everyone. <laughs> the organization that gives work to all official musicians in the Soviet Union is Gosconcert. Lenconcert is the Leningrad branch. I'm a freelance member of Lenconcert. All the same, Lenconcert doesn't try very hard to get me concerts. Doesn't pay me any particular attention. They're afraid of the noise that surrounds me and several other musicians. They don't need noise at all. They need a plan, something like that. What they do bears little relation to creativity. Lenconcert is a state organization. They're busy with entirely non-artistic, concrete matters. They have some papers which make them do something or other. Staging their own concerts is difficult. Ironically, what sometimes helps them is the bureaucracy itself. If some palace of culture needs to fulfill its plan, they'll do anything they could to get an unofficial group like Aquarium, so they'll be guaranteed a full house and big receipts. They'll have fulfilled their plan for three months to come. What we need is a hall and the possibility of regular concerts. Just once a month. We don't need anything else.
I've invented my own way of conducting. It seems most effective. I focus everything on myself. I've worked out a system of gestures that my musicians know well, so they know what to play when. If, for example, I jump with my left foot in the air, they know they should play Shostakovich. When I jump with my right leg up, they must play, say, jazz or bebop. Mother, she likes my concerts. She comes about once a year and enjoys it very much. She says, you jumped wonderfully today. This is the industrial section of Popular Mechanics. It's headed by another Sergei who always likes to be known by what he calls his artistic pseudonym, Africa. The industrial section find their instruments in dumpsters and junkyards. Africa is enrolled as a student somewhere, but has been playing the drums in rock groups for some years. He flouts Soviet convention openly. Sometimes I do feel a bit afraid because of the way I behave, but not much. I don't do anything against the law. I understand perfectly that if I live in this country, I must obey its laws. If I lived in England, there'd be something I shouldn't do there. If I lived in America, there'd be something I shouldn't do there. Every country has its peculiarities. While Pink Street hair is not against the law, it has aroused enough suspicion for Africa to be questioned by the police. Sergei has recently managed to get an official musical job. He advises teenagers on how to play amateur pop music. It's not the most demanding work for a trained concert pianist. I'd earn lots of money with the greatest of pleasure, but only for what I wanted to do. I can't stand being told what to do in music. I can take advice from people in other areas, but as far as music and sounds are concerned, I think I know everything. I absolutely can't stand advice at all. Melodia is the state recording company and provides the only means of making a record in the Soviet Union. Sergei's name does not appear on the jacket of any Melodia record. Where it does appear is on records in the West. Tapes of his and other unofficial Soviet musicians are smuggled out. But to protect the Soviet artists, the responsibility is taken by Leo Records, a small London-based company. Leo Fagin is the label's producer. Himself Russian, he left Leningrad and the Soviet Union for London's King's Cross 12 years ago. We know that a prohibited fruit is always sweeter, you see, than something that is allowed. Uh, strangely enough, you see, that uh, musicians in the Soviet Union, they are not terribly keen nowadays to make a record with Melodia. Uh, 
you see, there was a situation in the Soviet Union that everybody was dying for a record. To make a record with Melodia was considered to be the top, you see, you, you could, in the Soviet Union. But now, musicians, they sort of realize that, okay, you deal with Melodia, that means you won't be able to play what you want to play. You will be able to play only what you are allowed to play. And secondly, the recording won't be of that superior quality. The pressing will be lousy. The sound of the record will be awful. And this record, ultimately, when it is released, it will stay inside of the Soviet Union. And nobody is going to hear uh, this record outside of the Soviet Union. Melodia. Melodia thought about trying to make a record with me. But each time, they got scared that the bosses of the Leningrad branch wouldn't agree. That they'd say, Kuryukhin has a scandalous reputation. How can we record him? We'll release his record, and then Moscow will phone us and say, have you gone mad? Do you know what you've done? And someone will get fired. So they just release quiet, boring records, what they've always been used to. There are some advantages to having an undemanding job. Although it's the middle of the week, Sergei, his wife Nastya, his 18-month-old daughter Lisa, and the ever-present Africa are all off to the beach. The disadvantage is that he only gets 90 rubles a month, about half the standard wage. <laughs> To eat normally, not even that well, costs at least 500 rubles a month. But that still means you're walking practically naked. For example, to eat... Uh, oh, I don't want to. I, I can talk about sausage for hours. It's one of my favorite subjects. I can tell you what sausage is made of. I know all about it. I can tell you how to make smoked sausage. They don't do it right. Don't smoke it right at all. Firstly, well... <laughs> Okay, it's a long story, a special conversation. The next program will just be about sausage. I play with Lisa with the greatest of pleasure. If I'm not too tired, that is. But I'm always tired, so I never play with her. Though in theory, I'm a good father. <laughs> Nastya, she's frightened. She's shaking all over. What is warm, Shiroja? Yes, but now she'll be cold. We haven't got anything to dry her with. Who says I've got something? Since unofficial artists cannot earn their living by means of their art, and it's illegal to be unemployed in the Soviet Union unless you can prove you're being supported by your family, they often choose to work as boiler room attendants or caretakers, jobs that demand the minimum of time and effort and leave them free to get on with what they really care about. The lifestyle that Sergei has chosen, his refusal to accept the dictates of conventional society, means that he barely scrapes a living. Come here. What the lifestyle gives him instead is a passport into the powerful network of the Soviet intelligentsia. Once accepted into it, you meet everyone who matters in the artistic world, and those more established, more ready to compromise, often provide for the more rebellious, because they admire their talent and their courage. As a class, the intelligentsia is concerned with establishing broad human and cultural freedoms within the Soviet system, rather than the more specific rights pursued in the West.
Lisa hasn't yet been to one of my concerts, but I think she'll like it. I'll think up something special for her to do on stage. Sergei's friend Kolya is another unofficial artist, but he's better known as the Soviet Union's number one Beatles fan. Here, as in many such Soviet homes, the Western visitor is reminded of the 60s and all they stood for. Can you hear it from there? Only one channel is working. The Beatles appeared. Elvis Presley appeared. Rock and roll appeared. Millions of wonderful people appeared and reached us. Irrespective of our government and ideology, we heard all of them. Irrespective of our Iron Curtain, we heard it all. We've got high on it. It was the start of a holiday in Russia for my generation. What soul are you going to play? Same one? The same one. Same arrangement, same principle, like this. And at the same time, <laughs> that'll be better if it works out. I don't want to spoil anything. No, little gentleman, let's have another. Of course. Is this straight gin? Yes, I think so. Yeah, I'll add some tonic. The first Beatles songs I liked. When I first heard the Beatles, I didn't like them, and gradually I started to. Noble gentlemen, Russians, let's drink to good music, too. Really, sometime you think you like it all. Sometime you think there really isn't any bad music. You like it all, like it all. Even all kinds, all kinds, all kinds of crap like what's on the radio. Rock music unites us like, like cement. We're all the bricks, but music for us is, is above everything. It's vital bread, people, relationships with people, friendship, love, sort of Christian love. Russian Orthodox love. Well, maybe not. Anyway, everything that comes from there, from even 1,000 years ago, this love hangs above the world, this Christian love. What we read about in the Bible, all those fables and proverbs. It's all poetry, a total poetry that was embodied for me by John Lennon and no one else. Anything from the West is of interest to the unofficial set, as indeed it is to many Soviet citizens. This copy of the Observer Color Supplement is of particular interest, as it has an article about Soviet rock music. It's meant to be some group called Doctor. Yeah. Ryder must have made it up herself. I've never met this Doctor group. She liked this guy's makeup and thought it was the latest thing. There's no such group here. I've never heard of them. I know everyone in Soviet rock, and there's no such group. The group called Doctor. It's either her imagination or some really bad group. Aren't they great? Who? Oh, look at these.
despite, or perhaps because of the difficulties, the Leningrad rock scene is flourishing and new groups are constantly appearing. Kostya Kinchev is a newcomer with a large following. He usually sings with a group called Alisa, but he and Sergei admire each other and have arranged to play together. Communication, space, to write what I feel, to radiate the pulse in me, and the text is born naturally. I just want to sing, to make contact, communicate with people by means of my songs. Soviet rock culture has only recently taken shape. Until then, everything was a pathetic imitation of the West. And now, at last, now our young people listen less to Western rock groups and more to Soviet rock groups. Groups from the Leningrad Rock Club, like uh, Aquarium, Kino, Strange Games. They record their music from one tape recorder to another, and practically the whole country listens to it. That's what we call contemporary Soviet rock culture. Of course, I'd live well if I got paid for my music. But since I don't, I live how I live. I do what I want to do. If in addition I got money for it, that would be really great. <laughs> the only place they could find to play today was here, in one of Leningrad's few remaining privately owned houses. It belongs to friends of Sergei's and was given to their grandfather in perpetuity by Lenin himself for services rendered to the revolution. Listen to this music we call rock. There's no particular aggression. They, they just sing about what they're doing, what's going on. It's all quite simple, normal, understandable. You know, when you watch TV and someone comes along to sing, you, you start to feel rather ashamed because of this ridiculous nonsense. And because there are people who accept this as the main thing in culture today. State-approved art and state-unapproved art can coexist more easily nowadays. 
and despite their unconventional behavior, Sergei and his friends see themselves as part of an established Russian tradition that in Leningrad stretches all the way back to Pushkin. The atmosphere that exists today is very different from what it was before. Now there is some sort of room for action. Not a lot, but there is some. But it's a great shame that musicians don't get paid any money for their concerts. They can't get instruments. And the instruments they use are lousy. I'm simply not part of the system. When they invite the composer Sergei Kuryokhin to festivals abroad, since I'm not a member of the Composers' Union, they're told there's no such composer in the USSR. As a rule, they just answer with silence. A year ago, I would have said that the most important thing for a Russian musician was to travel. Now I don't know what to do. No, I'd rather travel abroad with pleasure. But it becomes more and more problematic. I don't think I'll ever manage to hear live the musicians I've known for years by their records. It's a shame. Time's passing. The time we spend just depends. We're rarely on the roof. The thing is, it depends what you call time. Time's a very philosophical concept, a purely philosophical category. So it's hard to talk of time, to talk of, to call what we spend time. We're spending something, we don't yet know what it is. A person who comes to a popular mechanics concert should literally sit there with his mouth open without understanding what's going on. What goes on should be visual as well as musical. So while a ball of lightning comes from the stage, three or four pigs appear, which Africa starts to milk. But the music continues. The music will be good. I vouch for that absolutely.
popular mechanics in frequent concerts are always full to capacity. They had to close one station on the Leningrad subway last time to keep the numbers under control. The unpredictable nature of the band's performances, which alarms the authorities, delights their followers. The audience is wide-ranging, mainly the intelligentsia, and uh, people who try to get in to see a show that's already gathered a certain amount of fame, uh, double-edged fame. These performances always attract a lot of people. When there's something both new and unofficial, someone says that there's going to be a... Uh, pss, 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 pss. Really? And that's it. People gather. In this way you can gather millions of people. You can certainly collect all of Leningrad together. If they gave us a stadium for three days, we could gather the whole town by saying there was to be a... Um, pss, 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 pss. Does Sergei hanker after official recognition? No, we simply don't need it. Besides, no self-respecting concert organization, unless it's absolutely crazy, is going to give popular mechanics official status. It's a, a direct opposite of what they're used to seeing on stage. I think they try and make music dependent on politics here. And I think nobody needs that. Music has practically nothing to do with politics. I'd like music to get its independence here. I do hope that the, so the Soviets, the authorities, would be sensible enough to see only the musical side of this film and not to try and incriminate any, anything political for it. I, I just hope, because it's not a political thing at all. It's not a kind of uh, protest or anything, you see. One, a friend of mine once sent, uh, uh, said to me a phrase, he said this, you see, if the Soviets really were clever, if they wanted to kill everything, they would allow everything to flourish, and everything would be killed the next day, everything would become as official as anything else, and nobody would be interested. So, but again, it's a very hypothetical suggestion. No one knows.
на эскалацию террора российских властей угнетенное население Южной Африки отвечает растущим сопротивлением. Ожесточенные столкновения с карателями проходят в большинстве африканских гетто. Предпринимаемые администрацией Рейгана шаги по реализации программы милитаризации космоса It's difficult to say what proportion of the young intelligentsia inhabit this hinterland on the fringes of Soviet society. But their influence on popular taste is growing, as they sit and wait and push their boundaries forward inch by inch. Судов Международной Организации Сторонников Защиты Окружающей Среды Гринкес. That was all that jazz. We'll talk now about music, young people, and Western influence in the Soviet Union with three people who know that country well. David Shipler was the New York Times correspondent in Moscow from 1975 to 79. He's the author of the book, Russia, Broken Idols, Solemn Dreams. Paul Quinn Judge is now Moscow correspondent for the Christian Science Monitor. And Richard Denton is the series producer for Comrades. Richard, how were you able, you, the film was made without mm. Soviet permission, how were you able to pull that off? Um, well, interestingly enough, it probably wouldn't be necessary to do it now. Uh, it, because of the relationship between us and Sergei and all of those people, I mean, we tried for 18 months to, to get permission. They knew we were trying. And in the end, we said to them, we're not going to get permission, do you want to go for it anyway? So they said, yeah, go for it. What, I mean, what, they had nothing to lose. But the, theoretically, the Soviets could have stopped you, authorities could have stopped you, couldn't they, if, if they well, had it, wanted to? It, de it depends on how efficient you think they are. I mean, if you're, you're allowed to come in as a tourist, you're allowed to bring a video camera. Um, it depends on how efficient you think they are. I mean, I, I don't actually belong to that group of people who think the KGB is terribly efficient. Mm. I don't, actually. You say you think they would, you wouldn't have had any trouble uh, shooting it now. What, why are things? Well, I mean, I, I have so. filmed Sergei uh, in the last year uh, with no problems at all. Uh, he's now uh, about to co-direct a film for Len Film Studios. Uh, he's um, the musical director of a new um, theatre. Um, I've filmed him and filmed other, and people are filming him and other people like him now quite freely. Is he still as much on the outside as then as we saw him in the in the film? I think he is, but largely because he wants to be. I mean, I think, I think it is a difficult situation for them. They, they, they like being on the outside. It's part of the reason for their existence to stay on the outside. Paul, how much have things changed uh, in, the, in the three or four years since this film was, was shot? Quite considerably. Mm. A, a lot of the rock musicians here have become extremely mainstream, um, widely recognized, playing in official concerts. They've got to the point that one of them that we see in this film, um, Boris Grybjenshikov, has called, has put out this rallying cry of back to the underground, because they feel they're being taken over by the mainstream. Um, a couple of them have been in fights with the police. The singer from Alisa, who we see in here, was uh, in a well-publicized fight with the police in Leningrad recently. They're still misbehaving as much as they can. I think probably try to keep some sense of illegitimacy. At the same time, the rock that they perform has come under attack by some of the leadership 
Um, the second-ranked leader, Igor Ligachov, doesn't like them very much. Sorry. Neither does the Minister of Defense. So you have, a, you have a sort of toing and froing going on right now between the musicians themselves and the, some members of the government. But overall, they have more latitude now than they did. Isn't that correct? Yeah. I mean, they said uh, in, the, in the film, Sergei says that no self-respecting um, agency would sign up his people. And that's no longer true. They, um, I think they are as shocked as uh, the changes that have overtaken them as people in other, f in other forms of artistic life are in the Soviet Union, who, people who were on the outs three years ago who have suddenly found themselves accepted. How are they handling it, then? Um, a certain degree of discomfort and a certain degree of euphoria. Uh, there's, a, there's a mixture of the two there. It was quite interesting. Um, last time I saw Sergei, he said with some pride that Ligachev had been asked about popular mechanics and said popular mechanics is something is the kind of thing we don't need. He was quite pleased about that. But on the other hand, Africa had been in a film uh, and had his picture in Pravda, which he kept in his top pocket so that when he was stopped by the police, he could take it out and flash it at them and say that he was an important person. <laughs> so it's a sort of strange balance that they so have it, to balance. it works both ways. I think you can see this in a, in a way as a, a phase in a whole long tradition of cat and mouse between... Uh, rather free-thinking artists and the state. Uh, the state representing a rather conservative set of impulses in Soviet society, but changing its tactics, to changing the, the, the limits from time to time. And now you know, they're in a phase where the limits are being pushed back. And, uh, it's becoming but, much more permissive. But, but one of the interesting things about this film that goes beyond rock music or jazz is that finally it shows Soviets as people who are as loony as we are. Mm. And we always what do you have mean? this. Don't we? Don't you sit around at your house and bang? Yeah, I said as uh, loony metal as we are. instrument. Okay, <laughs> not. A, I, I don't usually use metal instruments these days. The neighbors <laughs> get stroppy. But it's we tend to have this stereotype as as Russians as people who unthinkingly obey the state, and who may even rather like to be told what to do. And I think that impression is totally wrong. I think if they've been subservient and obedient in the past, it's because they've known the consequences would outweigh the pleasure of uh, speaking back. Now, when the limits are being taken off to some degree, we're, we're seeing the, the zaniness, the, the, the anarchic side of Russians. But this the, the is other a thing very small to, minority. Yeah, no, no, not necessarily. It's, it's not the rock small. musicians are a small minority. Agreed. Uh, but they are only, they express some of the same feelings of an, uh, anarchism in a more distilled form than the person in the street. But to some extent, this is all in reference to the authority. That is, what makes it uh, attractive and what makes it interesting is its denial of authority, its re rejection, its rebellion. So that, uh, in a sense, when I, as I was watching this film, I had a feeling of deja vu, the 60s in America, yeah, when uh, it was an anti-establishment impulse, and anything that hadn't been approved by the establishment was great, you know, banging on a shovel in, in rhythm, you know. Uh, is this music? I don't know. Uh, some of it, uh, obviously, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of talent there, but uh, it, you know, it's almost... Uh, uh, you know, a negation of the well, standards. One of the things I found most intriguing about the film is that when it was shown in England, uh, there seemed to be an awful lot of common ground between the right wing in England and the communist system, because both of them would love to see these kind of people not operating. And I found that very intriguing. For, uh, for very much that reason, yeah. I think, that they are, that what they're doing is, is putting forward a set of value structures in which the state is irrelevant. Another, that's pretty another interesting point, I think, is during the time I was there in the 70s, and I think this has been true probably for the last 20 or 25 years, music has been the freest art. There's been much more latitude in music than there has in other forms of art. For example, in painting, uh, in the 70s, uh, the underground artists were doing a lot of political and religious art and a lot of abstract art that they couldn't get shown officially. It was mostly imitative as I think some of this music is imitative of, of what happens in the West. And very little of it was creative in its own right. It was, it was a statement. It, was a, it became a political statement because it, was, it demonstrated a certain affinity for, for the West and a rejection of the most conservative impulses inside 
the society. Yeah, the, but the, um, quite interesting, sorry, the, on the imitative thing, it's quite interesting that, uh, that in the past, those people who have probably been most accepted by the system have been those who actually have been most imitative of the West. And I think one of the interesting things about Sergei is that he isn't particularly imitative mm. of the West. And that if they were going around pretending to be the monkeys or the Beatles or whatever, the state could more or less understand it. It's, it's the fact that he's doing something else that is rather disturbing. Plus the fact that a lot of their lyrics, not necessarily Sergei's, but of, uh, of the other rock bands, are quite clearly political. Yes. They have a statement, a value judgment on society, on Soviet society, which is something that the leadership will not like. But the other interesting thing I think about the rock scene is, again, it, it typifies a sort of parallel societies that you have in the Soviet Union. You have official society where everything is well ordered and people behave and they uh, do exactly what they're supposed to do. And you have this parallel society, which, um, by which news of which travels by word of mouth. We got that in, in the film here mm -hmm. with Sergei saying this. Um, in the past, manuscripts would go from hand to hand, but you'd find a surprising number of people who had read <coughs> banned works of literature, which had gone around from hand to hand. The music, the music world was existing very much on that same plane. Mm -hmm. What about this whole notion, again, of, of Western influence? Um, is, is there, I assume there's as, at least as much as there was, there may be even more, uh, how, are the, how are the Soviets handling that? I mean, just overall. Well, the thing that amused me, it was about a year ago I was there, and the first Beatles record came out on Melodia. And that was just one year ago. That's the first time that the, the authorities have got round to... On Saturdays, in the park across the street from where I used to live in Moscow, you would go out in sort of midday Saturday, and there would be all kinds of men standing around in their overcoats, it was as if they, they were at a cocktail party, except no drinks, and they all had these big, bulky briefcases. <laughs> Every once in a while, you'd notice one of them uh, take out a record and slip it into another's briefcase, and money would change hands rather quickly. It was a black market in Western records. So I think this has changed tremendously, and Paul can talk about it, but I, you know, the, the, there's much more interaction with the West now. Than but the thing is, anyway, we, we haven't defined what we mean by Western influence. Uh, Middle-aged Italian crooners have always been very popular <laughs> in the Soviet <laughs> Union, and the leadership probably loves them. Um, like the, the Vietnamese communists love Maurice Chevalier. It's that sort of hang-up. Um, a lot of rock groups are quite acceptable in the Soviet Union. What is much less acceptable is what the some of the Soviet rock musicians are doing now, which they call um, Soviet rock, which does um, consciously move away from many of the tenets of Western rock that they, mm. they've learnt, um, moves into jazz, and starts speaking very frankly about their own sense of alienation from their own society. That is not a Western influence. Well, it, jazz is a Western it worries, influence. It worries, and it worries the leadership very much. But how much of that is performed in a place that, or in a, in a forum that you could consider officially sanctioned? Can they, can they get away with any of that? There are very few fora that aren't officially sanctioned. Um, and, and you find plenty of holes in the system, plenty of um, dom culturi, the, the houses of culture, the concert halls belonging to the party youth, for example, where some pretty wild rock concerts or jazz concerts take place. Oh. The and system is full of holes. We just seem to forget this. Quite but, often. I mean, the group we saw here was, you know, was having its own concerts. You're saying that this sort of thing continues and it's moving it, even it's further. Developing. It's developing much more. And as it's becoming considered at least superficially acceptable, the holes um, in the system are widening, and these guys can perform more more widely than they ever thought possible. It's not a, the system isn't black and white or categorical either. Uh, you know, jazz concerts uh, used to be held in halls uh, that were owned by factories at the outskirts of Moscow. I mean, they were at the outskirts, and, tick and they weren't publicized. And the only way you could find out about them was by word of mouth, and the only way you could get tickets was to know somebody who knew somebody in one of the groups. But they were always full, the concerts, and they were in big halls. They were just not in the center of Moscow and not well publicized and not on television. It's, uh, the the déjà vu with the 60s is, is very real. I just hope, in a sense, that they do better with their 60s than we did with ours. All right, gentlemen, on that note, we'll leave it there. Thank you all for being with us. Paul Quinn Judge, David Shipler, Richard Denton. For Frontline, I'm Judy Woodruff. Thank you for being with us. Good night.
Frontline is produced for the documentary consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. Major funding for this special Frontline series was provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Additional funding was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. For a transcript of this program, please write to Frontline, Box 322, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. For video cassette information about this program, write to Films Incorporated, 1213 Wilmette Avenue, Wilmette, Illinois, 60091. This is Tamara Russo. She works in a hospital. A few weeks ago, she got drunk and stole a knapsack from a bus station. Now she's facing trial for her crime. An extraordinary look inside the Soviet justice system. Watch the trial of Tamara Russo, next on Comrades, a special frontline series.